For this episode of KPBS News This Week, we're looking back on some of our best reporting on democracy in 2023. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabolsi. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma spent much of 2023 examining the pillars of democracy. In September, Amitha was part of a nationwide public media collaboration for Democracy Day, the threats to our system of governing and how much of that we're seeing in San Diego. Here, guys. 33 months after the January 6th assault on the Capitol, nearly 70 percent of Republicans nationwide still believe the 2020 presidential election was stolen. In the last 10 years, more than 29 states have passed legislation making it tougher to vote. Censorship is on the rise, and a growing number of Americans from both parties believe political violence is justified. How much of this sentiment has seeped into the San Diego region post-January 6th? San Diego Mesa College political science professor Carl Luna says somewhat with potential for more. Politics is local, but it's also national. And if any part of that tree of liberty is being poisoned, it's eventually going to spread out to the rest of the tree. KPBS set out to assess the health of democracy in San Diego through a handful of key indicators, threats to elected representatives, voting, censorship, and local news coverage. A recent University of San Diego poll found 66 percent of local elected officials reported threats have increased since taking office. Chula Vista Elementary School Board trustee Kate Bishop says sexually violent threats spike against her when she pushes for inclusivity. The ones that are more ominous and threatening are 100 percent from men, usually conservative men that identify themselves as such. Overall, access to voting in San Diego County is strong. California largely prevents gerrymandering by having an independent commission determine political districts. And the state does not have the harsh voter ID laws and limits on polling places that restrict voting in some other states. The censorship situation is a bit more cloudy. There have been isolated attempts to ban books on LGBTQ topics in Oceanside schools and county and city of San Diego public libraries. Misty Jones, director of the city library system, says she's up for the fight. I feel like libraries are kind of that the last stand for democracy, right? They are the location that anyone can come regardless of your circumstances, your background, your beliefs, whatever. Everyone can come and find something at the library. And, and that's what we stand for. We stand for freedom of access to information. However, on another key measure of information access, San Diego County is faltering. Its major daily newspaper, the San Diego Union Tribune, has gone from employing 400 people in the newsroom in the 1990s to just over 100 today. Local television news stations have also faced significant cuts in recent decades. Northwestern University journalism professor Penny Abernathy says those journalists covered major beats like education, city hall, and wrote investigative pieces, all hallmarks of local news. It is the glue that binds a community together and binds, and let me say by that, binds our society together. And by the same time, it serves this country and this, this democracy by giving us the information that we need at the grassroots level to make decisions about who to vote for, uh, even where we should shop to get the best bargains. So when we've lost that, there is a great void into which uh, you can, uh, misinformation, disinformation can also flourish. And it has through highly partisan news outlets and social media. This fragmented news world is a far cry from an era when Americans learned a uniform set of facts from a few media gatekeepers like major newspapers and the big three television networks. UCSD political science professor Barbara Walter says today's ecosystem allows people with ideas and attitudes that were historically on the fringe to enter the mainstream. They can find each other really easily. They can chat with each other um, really easily. They can be fed information from Putin or from the, you know, um, 
from the Proud Boys or from any number of organizations um, whose goal is to actually radicalize these individuals even further. All of that is really, really easy. There's no regulation. Um, and, and of course, the algorithms then just accelerate that. But on this Democracy Day, local political scientist Luna sees silver linings. Americans still prefer democracy. Another nice positive thing, it hasn't gotten violent yet. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. 2024 will be the first presidential election, with California holding an earlier primary on March 5th. One way to stay informed is with the KPBS Voter Hub as our coverage ramps up in the weeks ahead. That is where you will find our stories, along with information on voting locations, important dates, and candidate information. Look for the link to the Voter Hub on our homepage, kpbs.org. Well, this year brought sudden change to San Diego's largest newspaper. The San Diego Union Tribune is now owned by a company that owns more than 200 newspapers nationwide. Amitha Sharma says readers can look to neighboring counties to get a sense of what will come next. Sitting outside a sandwich shop on a recent fall afternoon, Riverside resident Robbie Short says he's a regular voter, but he never reads the local newspaper, the Press Enterprise, before voting. In same fact, he does no research at all. I always see the same names most of the time. And uh, if I see a new name, I'll look them up, or I won't even look them up, and I'll just vote for the new name, because why not? Former Riverside Mayor Ron Leverage says the press enterprise used to matter a lot more to residents. He recalls a time more than a decade ago when people in the community and elected officials read the local paper first thing in the morning. I'd be surprised if anybody at City Hall looks at the press enterprise now. Today, the newsroom that once employed more than 100 journalists covering all of Riverside County is now down to a handful of reporters. In 2016, the New York-based hedge fund Alden Global Capital bought the press enterprise. A significant number of those cuts have happened since then. The watchdog function is not there. The information function is not there. We are an explicit example of the kind of disappearance of local news. This July, Alden acquired the San Diego Union Tribune. There are already signs that the Union Tribune is likely following in the footsteps of the Press Enterprise and other Alden newspapers. Buyouts, layoffs, bare bones local coverage. Hours after Alden announced it bought the Union Tribune, the company offered buyouts. Journalists left with decades of community memory of corruption cases, courts, public safety, and politics. Leverage says this leaves communities divorced from the give and take of formulating policy and from democracy itself. In American politics, access is local. It is not at the state, it's not at the federal level, it is local. The absence of information makes this democratic conversation locally uh, uh, almost non-existent. The Orange County Register is another cautionary tale. 20 years ago, the paper had hundreds of journalists covering San Diego's neighbor to the north. Frank Mickadite worked as a reporter, editor, and columnist for the Register. He says its mission was to saturate the county with news coverage. We had, you know, an investigative team, and we just poured a lot of money into, and, and resources in, into just every corner of journalism that existed and that we tried to invent. And it was exciting to be part of that. Alden bought the register in 2016. Now, sources at the paper say one reporter has to cover as many as five big cities. Consider a recent scandal at Anaheim City Hall. Details didn't come to light until the city released its own investigative report. And what's kind of scary about it is that we found out about Anaheim but who knows how many other Anaheims are out there? Um, you know, we don't know. And we may never know. Lifelong Anaheim resident Cynthia Ward says now the public must grapple with the consequences. When corruption goes unchecked, it means that money that should be coming into our communities is going into the pockets of special interests. 
which means our taxes have to go up to fill potholes and do the things that we count on because of that money has been siphoned off. So ultimately we pay. Nicodite says the entire country, the very republic, is in trouble if local news coverage continues its downward slide. But he does not begrudge Alden or other private equity firms for hollowing out newsrooms. They do what they do. And it's like blaming a shark for doing what a shark does. I mean, it's just. He says we're all to blame for letting it happen. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. In part two of our series on Alden Global Capital, we take a look at the financial model the firm uses in hollowing out newsrooms. And you can find that story on our website, kpbs.org. When it comes to social media, Twitter used to be a powerhouse, but this year it got a new name and saw many of its users leave, including KPBS. Past users and media watchdogs say new ownership has allowed misinformation and harassment to go unchecked. KPBS SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge talked with local scientists about the changes they are seeing. There have been a lot of changes at Twitter. In fact, you're not even supposed to call it that. It's been renamed and rebranded as X, the name favored by Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and the world's richest man. Despite the changes, it's still widely used and valued by scientists, but they are seeing a lot less of what they used to like. What I like is the latest and greatest academic, vigorous discussions, uh, uh, links to new things, education, I'm seeing less of that. Aaron Goodman is a cancer physician and researcher at UC San Diego who says he's seeing a lot more of what he calls BS on his platform feed, polarizing content and stuff that looks like it came from bots. I don't have strong opinions on Elon Musk. My opinion is Twitter is worse since Elon Musk took over. My user experience is worse. He's not alone. Miguel Reina Campos is a postdoctoral fellow and an immunologist also at UCSD. He says the platform used to be democratic and accessible, but things have changed after Musk began letting people pay to promote their content and to receive the blue check, formerly a Twitter guarantee that a content source was legitimate. So when do you change that core underlying rule of the system, then everything gets sort of start shifting again to a point where now you were not seeing things that you were interested in. You're seeing things that people have paid for. In another controversial move, Musk allowed Donald Trump back on the platform. Trump had been banned after the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Earlier this year, National Public Radio and KPBS stopped posting on Twitter after Musk called NPR state-affiliated media. X did not respond to a request for comment. When he took over... Rebecca Nee is a journalism professor at San Diego State. She says Musk's political views tend toward conspiracy theories, and his content preferences were clear when he began laying off staff. He fired a lot of people, and a lot of those people had been working on uh, the content moderation issues of trying to take down uh, you know, disinformation and um, shut down trolls and bot accounts. And all of that went out the window. Nee says in its glory days, Twitter was a forum scientists could use to get out from behind the walls of their peer-reviewed journals. And they still do that, but faith in the platform has diminished. The best evidence of the departure of scientists from X came in an article in the journal Nature this August. Their survey showed about 7 percent left the site altogether, and nearly half of those polled recently joined competitors like Blue Sky and Threads. Yuri Manor is a San Diego cell biologist at UC San Diego. He says he doesn't discount the criticisms of the platform, and he agrees with some. But he has a caveat. Somehow people seem to think that these other sites are going to be better because maybe they're not run by Elon or by Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical that it's their fault that these places can suck sometimes. Biologist Reina Campos is dismayed by the new management and their apparent tweaks to the algorithms, but he's still using it. I haven't found anything as good as Twitter yet. That's a link to the paper. Someone could read the paper and clearly see my opinion. And then, you know, let's see, there's engagement. 
Thank God. I Aaron Goodman shows me his X feed with its posted studies and comments. Like Goodman, virtually all of the scientists I spoke to for this story are still using X, though they agree it's not what it used to be. If the cost to scientists is a degraded social media platform, the cost to Elon Musk was also considerable. He bought Twitter in 2022 for $44 billion. He admitted in a post last month that it's now worth considerably less. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. This year, software like ChatGPT opened our eyes to what's possible with artificial intelligence. Complex algorithms have the potential to impact the upcoming election cycle. Jacob Ayer looks at how some San Diegans are using the technology and weighing its ethics. Picture an online technology that with a little human prompting can write, code, create images and audio, and even make videos almost as good as we can. That's now a reality. They're called generative artificial intelligence systems. AI refers to the development of computer systems that can perform tasks that usually require human intelligence. University of San Diego professor Anna Marbit explains how one of them works. You say, hi, ChatGPT, how are you doing today? And ChatGPT produces a probability um, for many different responses and then picks basically the highest probability response and that's what it what it spits out. Hello, as an AI language model, I don't have emotions like humans do, but I'm functioning well and ready to assist you. ChatGPT is the most famous version of generative AI. It's only been out since November, but already has more than 100 million users, including many high school and college students. And I would say students who are actively using it, at least, you know, maybe for one assignment a week, or probably a third to a half. Manu Agni is a senior at UC San Diego. He says many students won't admit to using the AI tools because they feel guilty or they're unsure if it will get them in trouble. In fact, UC San Diego sent out a letter to students about artificial intelligence systems. Basically, they said if a professor isn't explicitly allowing it, it's not allowed. It's considered cheating. Agni says some UCSD professors have kept it banned, while others have given it a partial or full green light. Marvitt says while the text-based systems can sound convincingly human, they're not perfect. It is not necessarily helpful to be afraid of AI. The model can give false answers. Um, can give answers that they actually are not supposed to give. So they've also been trained to, you know, not give harmful answers to questions. Um, but you can trick them depending on how you prompt them. Like any powerful tool, AI can also be misused. AI is also causing a stir in the art world. All of the copies of your face walk into a bar. Some local artists like Beck Haberstrow apply the technology in their work but there is controversy over the way the systems are used. They're trained oftentimes on the work of artists or writers who are not being um, credited or compensated for that work. And so to me, um, that's a concern with how these kinds of programs might impact um, the arts community, broadly speaking. While some local artists are using generative AI to help create digital images and physical paintings, Haberstroh's works often question the ethics of the fast-growing technology. Who's well represented, who's not represented, who's made more visible by them, who's made less visible by them. So I think there's a lot of um, potential for uh, exploitation the more and more that we use these programs. Agni compares the current quality of ChatGPT's writing to a talented sophomore in high school, but he says it notably can't do citations just yet. Still, Agni says its use goes beyond the classroom. For college application essays, for applications to graduate school, job applications, scholarships, um, you know, writing samples for a pr creative job. I mean, this, this thing has infinite uses. Marbit says rules and regulations for generative AI will be key as the technology is here to stay. But she did want to clarify one thing to people who are wary or scared about the so far unregulated technology. But I don't think that we as a society need to be worried about, you know, general artificial intelligence at this point. I think we're still a long ways off from that. And while UC San Diego warns against using AI, Agni sees it as a tool rather than cheating. Plus, he says, there's pressure to embrace generative AI or risk falling behind. I mean, I don't use it to 
complete assignments, but certainly when I've had writer's block or when I've needed some inspiration on a topic, it's, it's, it's too tempting. Marbit says the technology could impact many fields in San Diego over the coming years, such as business, science, healthcare, and even the media. But just to be clear, ChatGPT didn't help me write this story. And for now, I'm happy about that. How can I help you today? Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. And this year brought a scandal that took down the chair of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors, Nathan Fletcher. It also marked 10 years since public pressure forced another major resignation. Amitha Sharma looks back at the allegations against the then San Diego Mayor, Bob Filner. I had to work and do my job in an atmosphere where women were viewed by Mayor Filner as sexual objects or stupid idiots. On July 22, 2013, San Diegans learned about their mayor, Bob Filner, from then City Hall staffer Irene McCormick Jackson, what many women had known for years. I was placed in the Filner headlock and moved around as a rag doll while he whispered sexual comments in my ear. Filner's misconduct extended beyond his staff, as San Diego businesswoman Patty Roscoe described to KPBS. He would come in and try and kiss me on the lips, and I'd have to squirm to get away. Ultimately, at least 19 women came forward. The revelation sent shockwaves throughout San Diego and made national headlines. The tenure of the city's first Democratic mayor in a generation was over in just nine months. But more importantly, women who had suffered in silence found their voice. I always say courage is contagious. Famed women's rights lawyer Gloria Allred represented Jackson and settled the former staffer's sexual harassment lawsuit against the city for $250,000. On August 23, 2013, Filner agreed to resign, but he was defiant. Not one allegation, members of the council, has ever been independently verified or proven in court. I have never sexually harassed anyone. Yet, in October of that year, he pleaded guilty to false imprisonment and battery charges involving three women. He was sentenced to three months home confinement and three years probation. Now, 10 years later, the Filner saga can be seen as a precursor to a much larger reckoning. The 2017 Me Too movement changed the international conversation about sexual harassment. Suddenly, powerful men were being held accountable and employers rushed to beef up mandatory workplace training. But what's really changed? Just this year, San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, a Democrat, resigned after a San Diego Metropolitan Transit Agency staffer accused him of sexual assault. Nationally, Allred says sexual harassment remains rampant. Still, she says there is good news. This year, a new federal law took effect. It exempted sexual harassment from non-disclosure agreements people sign when they start a job. And many women are just not going to put up with this anymore. And they are going to fight back. Julie Roginski co-founded the New York-based nonprofit Lift Our Voices that advocates for safe workplaces. She says the Filner scandal was transformative for women, transcending their own humiliation, uniting for support, and declaring enough is enough. And they really showed the country well before the Me Too movement really kicked off or this iteration of the Me Too movement kicked off that this was possible. Roginski says another watershed moment was when Filner's political ally, former San Diego City Councilwoman Donna Fry, said this. And we want the women of this city and the people who love them to know that sexual abuse and this behavior is not normal, not their fault, and they are not to blame. Bob Filner is to blame, and he needs to resign. Roginski points to Fry's words as foundational to what eventually became Me Too. You're talking about a major city. You're talking about a mayor who was the first mayor of his party 
to be elected in, in, in decades, and yet here were members of his own party calling him to account. Little is known about what Filner is doing now. In 2018, he publicly apologized again for his actions and asked for redemption. Amita Sharma, KPBS News. For one of San Diego's current leaders, 2023 will be remembered as the year she came out publicly. Katie Heisen spoke to Marnie Von Wilpert about her coming out story. You were hoping to have maybe private, quiet conversations with folks. Instead, I came out in the New York Times. <laughs> A reporter interviewed Von Wilpert after anti-LGBTQ plus protesters checked out all the books from a Pride Month display in a library in her district. When the reporter asked me, you know, are you a member of the LGBTQ community? I don't want to hide it. Von Wilpert says the article prompted tough conversations with conservative family members who were supportive in the end. But that's not the case for everyone. Many homeless youth in San Diego are LGBTQ plus children who were evicted by their families. Von Wilpert says she's pushing to open another shelter just for them. Even while she celebrates being out, she says she's watching gay rights be taken back. This summer alone, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that businesses can refuse some services to LGBTQ plus people. Grossmont Union School District ended a contract with a suicide prevention nonprofit that also assists LGBTQ plus youth. And the Temecula Board of Education tried to remove Harvey Milk, a gay civil rights leader and politician, from its curriculum. I'm not sure what my future looks like sometimes in this country, uh, which is something I never thought I'd say. Even still, she says, coming out was worth it. It's less isolating to be able to come out and, and to, to be free. Um, and as someone who who is a very public figure, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to just be who I am. To everyone else who came out this year or will come out today, she says, congratulations. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. And we hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabolsi. Thank you for joining us.